Welcome back, folks, to Contrary to Popular Wrestling. We have a great show lined up this week, Carmine. We are back with our untold stories of the AWA. We're going to have a great lineup of guests. You've been making some calls, Carmine. Who did you get lined up for us this week? Wow. Well, first of all, you know, we like the idea of this podcast becoming as fan interactive as possible i thought it would be a good idea to have an old awa fan to tell a story and today we have from racine wisconsin longtime awa wrestling fan mike wilson is going to be joining us telling us a little story from the past and then get this one <laughs> we're talking about the untold stories of the AWA, well, you can't leave out the unsung heroes of the AWA, and in my opinion, the greatest unsung hero of the AWA, the very capable sodbuster Kenny J. Kenny J, of course, known for being around the AWA through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. You know, Harley Race called Kenny J the best overall talent in wrestling. That says a lot coming from handsome Harley Race himself. Well, the boys just loved Kenny. I mean, I, I knew Crusher and Mad Dog and Baron and everybody loved Kenny. They respected him in the ring I mean, he's responsible for making all these guys look good and did a great job at it because he just wasn't going to be a, a job guy on TV and just lay down. He, the people knew that he was going to give them a, a little bit of a fight, that he wasn't going to go down easy. And uh, hence the name, Very Capable, Kenny J. Very interesting character. And I'm going to tell you, a happy-go-lucky guy and just a pleasure to be around and has some interesting stories. And of course, one of the things we're going to be talking about is his 1976 boxer versus wrestler match against Muhammad Ali. It'll be interesting to hear how that came about because we know, of course, about some of his more famous matches with Antonio Inoki and all that, but it'll be interesting to hear from Kenny J about what it was like working with Muhammad Ali, the greatest boxer of all time. I'm sure he's got some great stories about how that came about. Well, that match, you can uh, look it up. It's on YouTube. And in my opinion, it's the best exhibition, wrestling exhibition, that Ali had. It's much better than the fight with Anoki, that's for sure. And you mentioned the Baron earlier, and guess who we're going to close with, folks? We are going to have the Baron himself, Baron Von Raschke, calling us from Bloomington, West Germany, going to be joining us. It's going to be a great time talking to your old friend, the Baron. Ah, oh, the legendary Clawmaster. Another guy from the AWA that I had the great fortune of dealing with when I ran Mid-American Wrestling in Milwaukee. And actually, the second show that I ever did in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1993 was held at Wilson Park Stadium, an outside venue. My first thought as a promoter was, when was the last time the Baron wrestled here in Milwaukee? He hasn't been there in years. And I said, oh, come on now. That's my main event. So I promoted a main event match of Baron Von Raschke against the legendary Dr. X. Not Dick Beyer, but Tom Rocky Stone. <laughs> and that show did record numbers. It was the biggest crowd for any independent wrestling event held in Milwaukee at the time. We drew 600 people and I ran television commercials uh, with the Baron on them. I ran them during Raw and, uh, you know, that is all all the people need to know. <laughs> the wrestling fans in the Midwest will forever love Baron Von Raschke. I mean, and not only in the Midwest, but really, the Baron wrestled throughout the country. Main evented at Madison Square Garden against Bruno San Martino. He had a huge run in the Mid-Atlantic area, in Georgia, in Florida, and, of course, the AWA Midwest Territory, where he's just legendary. I mean, with the Crusher and, and uh, Mad Dog Vachon, the great matches that he had with so much of the top talent. The Baron is regarded in the business, as Bobby Heenan says, the nicest guy in the business. So, for me... This is truly an honorable moment uh, just to have him on. It means so much to me to have the great Baron Von Raschke on. 
And I hope our listeners are going to get a kick out of it as well. I think they will, because there's no way we could do an Untold Stories of the AWA without talking to the Baron himself. But before we kick things off this week, we want to remind folks again, if you're listening to us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up on this video, subscribe to our channel, it helps us out a bunch. And if you want to check us out elsewhere, you can listen to a audio version of this. If you're listening on podcast platform and don't know, on YouTube, we put videos together with each week's episode. We've got photos, a little slideshow. It's really, it's something you need to check out. But you can also listen to us on various podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it, we're probably on it. Be sure and subscribe to us there. Leave us a five-star review. It helps us out. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash contrary pod you can send an email to the show with questions comments concerns guest recommendations and more email us at contrary pod c-o-n-t-r-a-r-y-p-o-d at gmail.com and carmine with that being said let's throw things over to a fan of the podcast and a fan of the awa mike wilson now one thing that i thought would be very interesting would be to get a fan story a fan's perspective perspective and i've got the perfect gentleman on the phone right now he's from milwaukee wisconsin he was a longtime fan of my promotion mid-american wrestling also a longtime fan of the awa he saw a lot of cards in milwaukee and the surrounding communities mike wilson Welcome to Contrary to Popular Wrestling. Well, thank you, Carmine, for having me on. Uh, The story that I'm going to be telling tonight is the most interesting story of the shows that I saw in the AWA. It reminds me of some of the things that I saw um, later on involving CM Punk in your uh, promotion, Mid-American Wrestling, back in the day. Yeah, he was quite the handful. Let me tell you what. (laughs) Where and well, when I mean, did this card take place that you're talking about? This card took place in August of 1987 in my hometown, Racine, Wisconsin, um, at Horlick Field, which is about three blocks away from Horlick High School. But it's where they all three of the high schools used to play football on Friday nights. Now each school has their own field. But by 87, we were we were pretty much a spot town. We I think we had two shows that year, one in February, one in August. And this show took place in August. And the main event was Greg Gagne and Wahoo McDaniel versus Soldat Ustinov and Boris Zukov with Gary Darusha as the referee. It was your typical um, old school 80s tag team match. Wahoo was doing the work that night, you know, bleeding from the head like Wahoo did for a good part of his career. Greg was stuck on the outside. The Russians were double-teaming Wahoo, which would bring Greg into the ring. Darusha would have to back him out. Then you would have Zukov or Yusinov go over and taunt Greg, which would draw Greg in. Darusha would have to back him out, and the Russians could double-team Wahoo again. Right. Well, toward the end of the match, Soldat Yusinov is choking Wahoo on the outside. He's on the floor. Wahoo's hung over the top rope, neck on the top rope, rope, bleeding from the head, showing no signs of light at all. You would have thought Wahoo had died right there. Zukov goes to pull Greg in. Darusha and Zukov have their back to Wahoo and Ustinov. Greg is facing this, but can't really see past Zukov. Now, I'm sitting second row. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a yellow streak running toward ringside. And I didn't even have time to look to the side when all of a sudden, this drunk guy in a yellow rain slicker is absolutely windmilling Ustinov in the back. I mean, if this dude was either uh, Butch Miller or Luke Williams, he'd have been bushwhacking him. But he's windmilling him right in the back. And he was tagging him, too, because Ustinov is selling it. And and selling it, like Vern Gagne had said, you're either going to sell for Greg or you're going to sell for me. So Ustinov runs a couple feet away. This is where the drunk fan made his mistake because he went after Ustinov again. Never got there. Wahoo, being an old school guy, and we all know the stories of Wahoo back in the day, the thing with the gun, he shot Dick Slater in the leg. Right. As the fan is going past Wahoo, Wahoo flicked his wrist. Now, Carmine, I know you're Italian, but I don't know if you're Catholic. 
But let me tell you, my mom was, and the Pope gets more wrist action on a blessing than Wahoo got. And he must have clipped this guy in the temple because the guy's arms went out and he fell backwards. And if security hadn't been there, the guy would have taken the perfect flat back bump right there on Horlick Field. Wow, that's something else. Wahoo and they, just, and they just car- knocked him out. Was the guy knocked out for a while? Don't know. Security carried him out. Security had wow. him under the arms and walked him out. <laughs> And this is this is one of those shots that if he hits Ric Flair with this in like '79, Flair hits him back and says, "Hit me, goddammit, it!" You know. <laughs> and and the crazy part is, for years, for me, I hadn't smartened up by then, and I'm maybe not real smart now. But at that point, it's kind of like you're walking in the mall by yourself, and then all of a sudden you're in the locker room where the mall Santa is getting into his street clothes. Like right. you know what you're looking at but you don't know what you're seeing. It was probably 10 years before I realized what I had actually seen. And my dad didn't cop to it because even though I found out later my dad saw it, I think my dad was trying to make sure that I stayed a kid a little bit longer and didn't learn anything that maybe a 10-year-old maybe shouldn't know. Wahoo came to the defense of the dastardly heels, and it just blew your well, mind I mean, as a kid? It really did. You know, a 10-year-old kid, you'd think Wahoo would be cheering the guy on or, you know, trying to help the guy. Now that I'm older and Carmine, you're a promoter, you know that Wahoo, at, in that moment, did the right thing. Oh, yeah. It's common, especially back in the day, for the wrestlers to stick together. I mean, re- really, whether heel or babyface, I mean, it sounded like that this fan just couldn't control control himself and he wasn't backing down and security wasn't doing their job so uh wahoo had to take it into his own hands literally and give him a backhand and knock him out wow did it make the papers was it in the paper or anything no 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 uh i believe the like the write-up would just have the match results and that's it but you got to remember this is southeastern wisconsin this is 1987 where we had pat still in the area Miller was still there. Schlitz was still doing business. We had a lot of beer flowing at a lot of public places growing up. And man, it wouldn't surprise me to find out that maybe that shot knocked the guy conscious, you know, sobered him up. (laughs) Maybe it sobered him up. Hey, maybe so. Maybe so. What a great story, man. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Hey, you know, I I love the show. And if you've ever, if you ever get a story, if you ever start doing a show on uh, the best of mid American or some of, some of the uh, fan interaction CM Punk had with some of the local fans up here, you know, I've got about six of those stories. (laughs) Thank you, Mike. Thank you, man. We'll definitely be in touch, my man. Have a good one, man. Have a great night. Let me tell you, listeners, I could not be more thrilled to have our next guest on. He's an AWA legend. And when you speak about the AWA and the untold stories, I think you really do need to include the unsung hero of the AWA himself, known as the sod buster, the very capable Kenny J. Kenny J. <laughs> that was a wonderful introduction there, Carmen. And I, I really, really appreciate it. But I want to tell you, the AWA, the 60s, 70s, 80s, were the greatest. I mean, they had some great, great wrestlers in this town. I'll never forget the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know. But uh, that was AWA. And they knew what they were doing, and they did a great, great job. You know, we spoke with Eddie Sharkey a few times here on the podcast, and one thing that he keeps reiterating is that the guys in the AWA in particular were just a bunch of great guys, all of them. That is very, very true. In the ring or even out of the ring, you know. They had to do their thing in the ring. Uh, You know, it's uh, you're in there, you know, it's just like, Playing football, if you're going to play football, you get out there and play, you know, you don't goof off. So it's almost the same as any other sport. If you're going to do it, do it well and perform well, because that's what people really wanted to see, you know. And mm-hmm. we could do it. I could do it. I mean, with all the great talented, with Bachwinkle and those, uh, Crusher, you know, they, they, they could do it. And, uh, 
it was just automatically for them to perform and and give the people what they really wanted to see you know you guys got everybody got along really well i mean uh it it says something about the guys i think from minnesota and wisconsin and so on i think it's the general mentality of the guys i mean they're all we're talking about all of eddie sharkey's trainees i mean you know on the longest list God, every yeah. single one of those guys were good guys. Well, know, they were Adam good guys, and, 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 <laughs> and there were some uh, uh, bad guys now and then, you know. But yeah, like I say, you if, if you're out. in the ring, whoever you're in there with, that's why they call me capable. Because I, I was in the, uh, in the dressing room one time uh, with uh, guys from Chicago, and uh-huh. they got the uh, Mad Dog. And they said, no, yeah. we don't want them. We, we don't want to wrestle them, you know. And Vern said... If you're coming here, you wrestle who I want to. Otherwise, don't come here and don't become a wrestler. You know, so I took out everybody that came in new. Bill Miller, you know, Dr. Eggs, uh, anybody that came into town, I got them. And I, I never turned them down. I was always in there with all my blood and guts. I gave them a fight, you know. They they even uh, said it, you know. They, God damn it, at least, uh, you know, he's uh, showing wrestling, you know. So that's why they call me capable, you know, <laughs> and it stuck with me, you know. But uh, like I say, I wasn't as scared of anybody, you know. You like working a little snug, right, Kenny? Right. You, you bet. Like, you like laying, <laughs> laying the shit in and making it look good. And you bet. I can, yeah. I can tell you, I can tell you, I, I, I mean, you yeah, have but, utmost respect from the right. crush who I talk to often about yeah. you. He just, he right. just loves you and the Baron, I you know uh, he thinks mm-hmm. the world of you. Uh, we're yeah. going to have him on later in the podcast, actually. Okay. And, uh, and of course, Harley Race. Uh, Harley. Yeah. Oh, uh, he always gave me the thumbs that, up. <laughs> the best talent in the business. Period. Right. From period. 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 You created a lot of great careers <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> yeah. All these guys that came in were college you know they were uh amateur wrestlers you know right. uh, dr eggs and, you know all these guys and here i'm a little farm boy from holding for minnesota that had never even heard of professional wrestling till i went to milwaukee in 1956 you know but right. uh, you know that's so whoever i got i knew i couldn't beat them because you know like even billy gells uh, not, uh, well, not Billy Young, but Billy Robinson, you know. Oh, Billy Robinson. I okay. knew he, I'd never beat him because he was. But I had one of the best matches on TV with him. And people talked about that for years, you know, and it just it just uh, felt good for me to see something like that or do something like that. Oh, yeah. Like you mean you're, you're, you're wrestling one of the greatest guys in the world, period, uh, Billy Robinson. Right, right. I mean, uh, and, you held, and you held your own because the people respected you. They knew right. that you yeah. were tough, and they knew that you would give everybody a fight. And Even Vern Gagne. You, <laughs> you know, if they won the match, they left yeah. the ring with their, their hand raised over yep. beating somebody who had credibility, who actually, you know, the very capable Kenny J. Right, yep. that's right. Started, right in Milwaukee at the uh, Southside Armory. Yep, that's where I started. <laughs> Southside was Armory in 1957. Was it a while before they smartened you up? What was that like? Yeah, well, my first match, you know, I got uh, five bucks, but this was in 57, and right. I wanted to show the promoter what I got, you know, because I trained only for like three months at a school. That wasn't that great, you know, but uh, I got to know the, the teacher this? real well. He's my age, so we kind of worked things out, you know, uh, and we went to uh, Minnesota to a carnival. We joined carnival where we took on all comers, you know. Did anybody come up there? If it was a big farmer, 300 pounds or whatever, and he said he wants me you know, I had a wrestle. That lasted yeah, only the, two weeks. So, so <laughs> carnival circuit, Kenny, in the Midwest. Right, yeah, where they move from town to town, you know. And uh, we were doing good, but uh, I was getting my hair pulled and everything. Uh, we it lasted two weeks. I said, hell with this. I'm going back to Milwaukee. <laughs> so that's oh, when I went back. And then I started again. I went to uh, Southside Arbery. And then Billy Gals and Johnny Gilbert, I don't know if you know that, from Chicago. They'd always come there and wrestle, and they said, Kenny, 
why don't you come every Saturday to Chicago? We have like 12, 15 matches, you know. So that's what I happened. I started going there, and then a promoter seen me there, and he started using me all over uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, you know, all over in those little states right around Chicago, Illinois, you know. So that's where I really, really got started. And then, you know, I was up in, in 1960 up for the belt for a Judy Light Heavyweight belt with Billy Gelder and Johnny Gilbert against me and the Sheik. And the, this was the first Sheik back in, in the oh, 60s, yeah. early, yeah. early 60s. Sheik you know, but then I had to go in the Army. <laughs> Right, so I didn't get to right. get the belt. Let me ask you now. I understand that you you wrestled in Spain, correct? Right. Yeah, you wrestled. Okay, right. That, I, uh, was when that I, out of the army where you were stationed? Yes. Yeah, well, I was stationed in Germany, and Wally Carvel gave me four different promoters. It was London, France, Germany, and uh, Spain, and I wrote to all of them. And the guy in Germany and France and uh, Spain, they wrote back and they said, yeah, if you want to come in, we can probably use you. So I took a leave and I went into Spain, you know. But the first time I got there and they didn't have a match at Barcelona. So they said, come back. So about a month later, I went back and they got me on. And it was almost like the main event. I took on their number one wrestler in Spain where he had a nod in his head, you know. Uh, like a unicorn, <laughs> but it was awesome because I, I did heal, but uh, this it seems like some in Spain, they never seen that, you know, where we right. goddamn, we wrestled. We didn't just, uh, you know, lay around or anything. I wrestled that son of a bitch, was, you know. Was it, was it, was it difficult um, working with them? I couldn't speak Spanish. Right. They couldn't, some of them couldn't even speak English, so I never got to even talk to them. The promoter could speak a little English, but there was one wrestler there that was from United States. He was kind of interpreted for me to the promoter, you know. But it was you something that, they, that you know. That was Kenny. You recall who that was? Uh, well, the guy wrestler's name was Torres. He was like a Verengania here, you know, down there, you know. So he was a good, clean cut guy, you know. And we went about twenty-five minutes. Hit me with that damn unicorn in the head. <laughs> But it was something. It was really something, you know. I got thirty five hundred pesetas, which was equivalent to thirty five dollars in many in in the state, you know. Right. But back in the, in the, this was in the sixties when I was in the army, you know. I got I got out in sixty two, so uh, you know. So it was it was almost paid for my whole week uh, leave up there. <laughs> Oh, what fun. So that was great. How many matches did you do in Spain? Just that one. Oh, but, just one. Okay. Well, in Barcelona. But then he wanted me to go to Madrid mm -hmm. on Saturday. This was Friday and Saturday. But I had to be back at camp. Otherwise, oh, I'd have been I AWOL. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I'd have gone if I had a couple more days. He said, come, right. on, come to Madrid. We can sure use you. And then I told him, I said, I'm getting out in about three months. It was, this was March, April, May, June, uh, June July. It, well, I was getting out in May, and I told him if I could come back. He said, yes, just come back. Just let me know you can come back on, and work here. But I said, I got to go home, you know, because I haven't seen my folks or nobody for two two years, you know. I was stationed up there. So once I got back, and then I had to meet my beautiful wife, and then I mm -hmm. couldn't even go back to Spain. <laughs> Beautiful country. I had the opportunity yes. to go there yeah. on a wrestling tour back in the 90s. Just really? beautiful. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just, it is. just uh, great people and yeah. everything about the place. I just I yeah. just adored. Yeah. Let's talk about 1976. You get the call and they're setting up a match between you and Muhammad Ali. Right. Now, tell me, I'm very interested to know, who right. contacted you initially? Who was the first one? That was Wally Carbo. He called me. It was like 6 in the morning. Thank God, otherwise I'd have been out laying sod. But he said, Kenny, we got a ticket on a plane. You're going to Chicago to take on Muhammad Ali. And I would, uh, 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 I, I couldn't talk. I got so nervous. <laughs> Honest to God, I, I, I just lost my speech. But then he said, you're going to you meet uh, the, the, the great announcer with the sunglasses, the little guy, Barty O'Neill. Yes. He said, you both will, you're going to fly you right to Chicago. We'll have a, a limo waiting in the airport. We're going to take you right to amphitheater. You get dressed. 
Within an hour, you're going to be in their ring with Muhammad Ali. Wow. But this was going going on so quick that I didn't even have time to, you know, think about it, get nervous, you know. That was the best thing about it. But, it happened uh, so quickly. Yes. And right uh, away, you're on that plane and you're going to Chicago. Wow. You had yeah. to think it maybe it was a rib at first, huh? <laughs> well, it just almost sounded like it, you know. But I said, why would they pick me? Little old farm boy, you know. But uh, you know, I, 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 uh, we fought. I followed boxing back when I, I got to Milwaukee and everything, you know. And there were some great, great boxers. And number one on the list is Muhammad Ali, you know. So I, I got to go in the ring with one of the most famous boxers in the world, almost, you know. So it was like a feather in my hat. <laughs> So to speak, well, you know, most famous boxer of all time, period, that will ever period. exist. I mean, right. nobody like Ali. Nobody. And right. uh, this was to set up, of course, one of the few exhibitions that Ali did against wrestlers to set up right. for his big uh, fight with Antonio Inoki. Um, That's right. I've seen Buddy Wolf and Ali, and I've seen a few things that Ali has done. But I'm going to tell you what, my friend, your match with him, by far, the best one. And <laughs> well, the, uh, I'll tell you what, there is no lack of believability in the whole thing. Right. Everything just looked good and made sense. You were the wrestler, and you were yep. trying to wrestle with him. And you kept you trying, you were going in tight and trying to um, take him down. Right. You know, like, like I said, I gave it 110%. Yeah. Uh, he knew no. it. <laughs> 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 he knew it. But, uh, it worked out for good. You know, I lasted almost two rounds anyway, you know. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and then I had a bad referee, you know. Every time I got him and he went and rose, he had a break up, you know. You know who the referee was. Vergania. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bird got your referee, uh, Blassie. Yeah. Freddie Blassie yeah. was in Ali's yeah. corner, and Corner Cruiser was in your corner. He was in mine. I just love the guy. <laughs> what, a, what a deal, Carmen. I, I'll tell you, uh, people are still watching it on their phones. It's amazing, you know. God, one guy he said, Jeez, I see you got hit by Muhammad Ali. <laughs> he was a. You know, and I don't even know the guy, you know, but it's just amazing. Carbon. Let me ask you, was there anybody that maybe got in your ear, gave you some advice, I mean, about protecting the business in case for some reason, you know, Ali went into business for himself or anything like that? I mean, there has no. a, back then always be a concern about protecting the business. Yeah. Anything like that? No, nothing. You know, we they did bring me into his locker room, but just to meet him and say hi, you know. And go face to face almost, you know, but uh, right. there was no no bad talk like I'm gonna whip you or I'm gonna beat you, you know, <laughs> none of that stuff. I just said uh, let's go for it, you know. So that right. right after that they took me to the ring and brought him to the ring and it was a nerve. I was nervous all day, <laughs> but <laughs> I still gave it 110 percent. And uh, oh yeah, like you say, that people are still talking about that. They don't oh even mention, you know, Buddy Wolf in him, but, they, oh, we watched you, we picked it up on the on our phones, and what a deal, you know. I didn't lay around. I got <laughs> It looked like you got yeah. caught with, like, a little rabbit punch he got you with. Yeah, yeah. Then he body slammed me even. I said, we're crazy. Where did he learn that? He's a boxer. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I guess Fred Blassie showed him a few wrestling goals yeah 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 you know before I he also trained with the sheik too i heard that mm, yeah yeah both up in michigan at ali yeah, probably with uh far hat yeah he caught you uh i just watched it the other day and he okay. caught you with the same that same rabbit punch that got sunny liston it oh looked yeah very yeah <laughs> yeah I've, i figured I, I was just about out you know but i I figured this uh, this is enough. <laughs> yeah, I don't need another punch like that. <laughs> I don't think I could have got out, but uh, I, I I was uh, got to the count of ten and I was out. But uh, they had helped me in the dressing room and had pumped some air in me, and then I come, I come to. <laughs> right, but, exactly. Have a brandy but, and water, you feel like a million bucks. You bet. 
I'll tell you, on the airplane, we all got drunk. Me and, <laughs> me and Marty O'Neill. Oh, he loved his drink, his too. <laughs> but we had a good time. But coming back, you know, I think uh, even Bachwinkle was on. I don't know why he was on the plane. And Buddy Wolf. So we had a few drinks. <laughs> what a great time that had to be. Oh, yeah. you had to be on top oh. of the world. You had to be on I top know of the it. world. I did you, uh, you did you run into Ali after at all? I mean, through the years, no. did you ever run into him? Never did. Never did, did huh? after after that. No. Oh he wow! Was, you know, he got busy with Buddy Wolf was the second match, right? And I think by by the time that match was over, we were in the limo already going back to the airport. <laughs> oh, and I see. That's how fast things happened that day. Uh, you know, it was bang, bang, bang. You know, I right. just, I didn't even have time to. Get get nervous until I was walking into the ring, and then I seen him standing in the ring. You know, oh so how cool! You'd get a little uh, nervous. Great memories for you, man. What great memories! Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I got him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you started in 1960, and well, your first retirement match, at least, was with me with Mid American Wrestling in Milwaukee. Broadway, Broadway, yeah, yeah, in yeah, 2000 remember, in Milwaukee. Yeah, because you yeah. said you wanted to, um, after f uh, 40 years, you wanted yeah. to retire in the same place where you started. Right, um, yeah. Remember that? Yeah, we yeah, had a Yeah, yeah. I really started in 58, but 60 is when I really got going in Chicago, right. you know. But then when I had to go for the belt in uh, May of 60, May 11th, in fact, that's when I had to go in the Army. I had to be in the Army May 11, so I had to cancel. But then at uh, 62, I got out uh, in May, you know. And then I went back to Minneapolis here, and I talked to Wally Carbo again, and he said, sure, we'll use you. So then he started using me every Saturday, every Saturday, TV. Oh, geez. And then, boy, when I got to go to Milwaukee, you know, that was great because I had lots of relatives there. And I could right. take the family, and I could make a couple hundred bucks, and and have a, uh, see all my family, and it was great, you know. <laughs> right. But oh, that's that's uh, just great. What great times, huh? What great times. You, you were with great guys. You and Baron were were a fun tag team. For, yeah. Uh, I, I I loved seeing you guys tag up back in the day. You can believe this or not, but I tag team up with uh, Mad Dog Vashon in St. Paul one time. Why they put me and him together? But that's when I brought in a half a roll of sod, and I think we had Chris Markoff and uh, what's that Englishman, uh, Lord Alfred Hayes, and, and we wrestled him. And uh, uh, Mad Dog grabbed my roll of sod and rubbed it in his face. The, the grass part, the dirt part, his face was all black from the pee <laughs> from black dirt. You know, I said, for Christ's sake. <laughs> So that that was really something. God damn it! But uh, you know, I, I teamed up with a lot of guys. I believe you teamed with Crusher as well. Yeah. And, and there's also uh, I know you had some TV matches with uh, Nick Bockwinkle. Many of them, yeah. And Vern Gagne, and we always had a great match. In fact, one yeah. time I took on Bockwinkle, you know, right. and he was down and out. I don't know what the hell happened. He was sick or. Or he just didn't get it any night before or something. But he was down and out. And I almost beat the guy. Christ. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I had him down and everything. I said, Jesus Christ. And uh, that was, that's what I heard. That he, he wasn't feeling good. or He just was depressed or something. But right. I said, yeah, that would have been a fair in my head. I would have beat him there right on TV. <laughs> Did you but have I got to, you know, Horace Hoffman, you remember him? Oh, yes, of course. I beat him right on TV, you know. And Pepe Le Pew, you know him. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I beat him. I beat the Weasel. I beat yeah, him. Bobby you know. Heenan. Yes. Bobby Heenan. Uh, yeah. Buck Zumov. I, well, I didn't beat him on TV, but. Damn it, you yeah, should have. Yeah. But, <laughs> he deserves, but, you know, he deserved I, a good beating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but uh, yeah, but you know, I I have some oh some great great uh, moves 
not me, but I mean, with these guys, you know, and the way I beat them. You remember uh, Jesse the Body and Adrian Adonis? Of course. I beat him right on TV, tag team. Uh, I beat Adrian Adonis. Is that I, right? I rolled, I rolled him up, one, two, three. Wow. Then the shit hit the fan. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody had to watch out for that knee lift. Knee you lift betcha. catches it. It's all over. It's you all bet. over. They, they always said that. <laughs> hey, did you but, ever consider leaving the AWA, leaving the area, or are you just were comfortable living in Minnesota? Because that's really the only territory you yeah. work for, right? Well, me and my brother were in landscaping business, laying right. sod and everything. But actually, at the time, it wasn't doing too good. And I told Wally, I said, uh, could you send me? I'd go like to work steady, you know. Sure. And he said, well, we could send you to Oklahoma for six months. And then I thought about it. I had my wife and, and three little kids I had, you know. And I couldn't take them along, you know. So I said, you know, Wally, I, I appreciate it, but uh, I got to stick around because I, I got to stay with the, my wife and my three kids. And, and I think sure. it paid off because they're all wonderful to me now. <laughs> Well, you were with the uh, with Vern for almost what thirty years. You bet, right up there. Pretty damn close, hey. right? <laughs> yeah. Oh God. No. Well, <laughs> let me tell you what, Kenny. You are truly one of my favorites in all of the business. You know. Well, thank some... you very much, and I want to tell you thank you for using me in Milwaukee now and then. Oh. I really, really appreciate that. Well, are you kidding me? I mean, uh, you know, I'd be amiss yeah. if I didn't. And you always boosted the houses for me. Yeah, and, yeah uh, I try. And the I people try. <laughs> loved seeing you. And uh, let me ask you, how many retirement matches did you have? Because you came back out of retirement in 2000, I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, there was a lot of small organizations around here, like five, six different. And then they'd call me every, every so often. I said, holy crazy. Sure. I might as well keep going. <laughs> Might as well, right? If the phone keeps ringing, just keep you going. You bet. You <laughs> bet. You know, it, it would be since today, today, uh, up right now, it wasn't for the uh, disease. They'd be calling me just to show up and sell stuff and, and sign autographs, you know. But now with the disease, I just, there's nothing going on, you know. They all call me. Even Paul Ellering, you know, and they had a deal. And, oh, God, so bad to hear that animal died at at such a young age, you know, so Awful. it's sad, it's you know, but I guess we all got to go, huh? Yep. Only one person knows when our time is. Kenny, yeah, thank so you so much. Thank you so please. much for, for coming on. It really, really does mean the world to me. I, I think the well, world of you, my friend. Thank you very much. And maybe they'll be able to do the Crusher Fest next year and maybe we can see you there. Definitely. We'll definitely get together and share a couple of brandy and waters, which is officially the Kenny J cocktail, by the way. There you go. Two ice cubes. <laughs> <laughs> two ice cubes. Thank you, my Bread friend. Water, two ice cubes. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Have a great evening. Thank you. Have a good one. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it wouldn't be a show about the AWA without one of its biggest stars, a man known internationally, worldwide, in the history books as the master of the claw hold. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm referring to the one and only Baron Von Raschka. Welcome to the podcast. And that is all the people need to know. Goodbye. <laughs> that's this Rick Dink. <laughs> and that too. <laughs> Thank you, Baron. Thank you for agreeing to come on. We just had Kenny J on. We just chatted it up with him. Prior to that, on other uh, podcasts, we, we talked to Eddie Sharkey. And Eddie always talked about the Midwest, the Minnesota boys, Wisconsin guys, the AWA guys. Yeah. We're just a great group of guys. That territory was different than other places. Would you agree? It was one of the better territories to work. Everybody seemed to get along pretty good. And, uh, you know, when we had time, we would get together for uh, maybe a cookout or a barbecue or something like that. And uh, we had a good time. It was like a... Uh, good family territory. So there was a lot of camaraderie in the AWA. That's the word I was trying to look for. Yeah, <laughs> I remember speaking to Bobby Heenan once, and him telling me, in all of his years in the business, that James Rashke is the nicest guy in it. I'll never forget that. 
And it's been a pleasure calling you all of these years. And I definitely concur with that. I have met a lot of people in the business, Baron. You know, a lot needs to be said for how you treat people and and what a good person you are. Well, thank you and thank Bobby. Bobby's always been one of our favorites. (laughs) He was quite a a character. And uh, we always enjoyed Bobby, uh, you know, coming over to the house or we're going over to his house when he lived with his his mother a long time ago and then with his wife, Cindy. So, uh, yeah. He was a great guy. Call everybody on uh, Christmas Eve, even if you haven't heard from him all year, <laughs> right? Yep, He'd call yep, everybody. Yep, yeah. Yep. Crusher told me that, that he would, uh, Bobby Heenan would call everybody on Christmas Eve, get a little shined up, and uh, go through the phone book. <laughs> he was yep. a good guy. You were in Canada. If I understand the legend correctly, that Mad Dog Vashon was the first one to recommend that you shave your head and take on the German persona. Das ist richtig. <laughs> du bist sehr, uh, sehr smart. I just finished my uh, amateur career and uh, was looking for something to do. Uh, taught school for a year. And uh, anyway, uh, when I got out of the army, I was in the army and I, I busted my knee. And, uh, not busted, but uh, I broke a cartilage and I had to go be... Uh, I was stationed in Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn, New York, and they shipped me over to uh, the uh, Naval Hospital in Queens, New York, and they operated on me there, and one thing led to another, and uh, I'd been an amateur wrestler for quite a few years. Anyway, I woke up in a big room with a lot of beds in the hospital, and and the bed next to me, another guy was laying there, and we both had knee operations uh, the day before. He and I got to be buddies, and we kept us there for six weeks. He was a big wrestling fan. And I hadn't paid that much attention to pro wrestling. You know, occasionally uh, I'd see a show at home on TV or, or at my grandma's house or someplace. But anyway, uh, he uh, got me to go down to every Saturday when they had the TV from New York. The New York TV, they uh, had the tape on or the show on, I guess. It was a live show. I looked at it and I said, gee, that's something I might be able to do. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, I got into my head to write a letter to Joe Dusick, who was a promoter in Omaha, which is my hometown in West Germany, you know, Omaha. Of course. Joe was nice enough to write me back. I I wrote this long letter with uh, all my accomplishments in amateur wrestling, and I'm sure he read it to the boys in the locker room that night or something, and they all had a big laugh about it. But anyway... uh, he was nice enough to write back to me and say he didn't have any place to train me, but when I get out of the Army, he'd look him up, and he would uh, introduce me to Vern Gagne, who, who was training wrestlers at the time. And about a year later, I uh, ended my uh, tour of duty, and uh, I uh, actually taught school for a year, and during that time, I got hold of D- Joe Dusick, and uh, true to his word, he, he had me come down to the TV station, and he introduced me to Vern one night when the Minnesota guys were in town to do the Omaha TV. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, well, come up to the Twin Cities and I'll uh, see what you got. And uh, I borrowed my little brother's car because I, I was the car I was driving to school was uh, had three different colored uh, fenders and uh, different colored hood. That's the original color of the car. Anyway, it was a clunker. I bought it for 50 bucks. My younger brother had a nice car, so I borrowed that. I drove up to Minnesota. And they put me to work setting up the ring and refereeing. That's how I broke into the business, plus training with Vern Byrne during the days when he had time and lifting weight, weights at the Fifth Street Gym. In the process, after several weeks, maybe months, I don't know, I was uh, setting up the ring at the Calhoun Beach Hotel where they taped the wrestling matches, and I was sitting in this uh, control booth with uh, Al Darusha, who was the director, and he had all the buttons to push and the lights from the TVs and the monitors, and he was clicking things and doing things, and I was just supposed to be in there watching everybody go in the ring and trying to uh, see what they did and trying to learn things. The wrestlers wrestled downstairs, so I never even saw the guys until they came up the elevator, got off the elevator, and there was one door that was open that was backlighted, and that was in the hallway where they got off the elevator and they walked past the control booth and they went into the little arena area of the TV studio. And they jumped in the ring, and they'd fly by that doorway real, real fast, and nobody even bothered to look in because it was just another dark hole to them. They just get introduced, and the fireworks would start, and they'd go bing, bang, boom, and 
Uh, they'd get interviewed later by Marty O'Neill, and when they got done with their match, and they would be uh, interviewed to promote the, the next show, the arena show, and uh, then they'd leave. So I just saw them come in, go out, come in, come out, handsome Harley Race, uh, Larry the Axe Hennig, uh, Kenny J, uh, uh, Jay York the Big Alaskan, and just about everybody that was anybody in wrestling worked uh, the Minneapolis territory at one time or another. So all the big stars went past there, uh, Killer Kowalski, uh, Johnny Valentine. After several weeks, many weeks, I was sitting there in the dark and minding my own business and they were starting to introduce the wrestlers. Roger Kent was starting to introduce them and there was this, this figure that was walking past the doorway and he stopped and he looked at me and he pointed at me and said, you'd make a good sermon. <laughs> <laughs> and he jumped into the ring and tore the place down. Boom, 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 bang, boom, boom. Went down, had a great interview with Marty O'Neill, and boom, he, he was gone. And then uh, the next week, the same thing happened. He stopped, and he looked in there and into the dark. He says, you would make a good German. <laughs> And you know, I, I was speechless because it, it kind of startled me. Actually, it scared me. That's what it did. But anyway, uh, this happened three or four times. And uh, finally, he said, you would make a good German. And I said, I am a German. <laughs> and uh, ethnically, I was German. So, uh, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, but he was not wrestling in the territory because I was going... I was going to the town, around the town setting up the ring and usually refereeing. So, but I never, I never saw him in the dressing room, never saw him at TV, and never saw him in dressing rooms at the different towns we were going around the uh, state of Minnesota and Wisconsin and uh, up into Winnipeg, Canada, and wherever we were, took the ring, I, I took it. Turned out he was working in California or someplace and just flying in for Saturday TVs. So he'd fly in, do his, do his work, and... Uh, fly right out but then he started to uh to work the territory that was to get him introduced into the territory and uh, if you know mad dog like i know mad dog he got over big so anyway finally uh, he started to work the territory so i was uh at a show setting up the ring and he was in the locker room and he started talking to me and he had been on an olympic team for uh, canada and i had uh, i'd wrestled i made the olympic team but i got hurt and didn't get to go to the olympics but Anyway, we had something in common in that regard, the amateur wrestling background. He liked me, and uh, our friendship grew over the next couple of weeks, months. And in the spring, he was going to leave and go up to his, to his home city up in uh, Montreal, Canada. So just before he was going to leave, I would met this girl, and uh, I really liked her, so we got married. <laughs> and uh, her name was Bonnie Bogey. <laughs> Not anymore. Bonnie She's now I, known as Mrs. Claw. <laughs> He asked me if I, well, I, I wanted to uh, go with him and be his partner. And I was a raw rookie, you know. I did, it hadn't been in the business, you know, a couple of months, three months, four months, whatever it was. And uh, so I said, sure. <laughs> so I told uh, the office, Vernon, Vern Gagne, Wally Carbo, and Bill Casisto to what I planned to go, do. And they said, well, good luck. <laughs> and... Uh, Bonnie and I got married, and then uh, a couple weeks later, we uh, put all of our belongings in our little red Mustang, and uh, we had a lot in common. We both had uh, rubber tree plants. We took those with us and a lot of other <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we drove our Mustang up to Montreal, and I was pretty naive. I didn't realize that Canada was a country with two languages, French and English. I always thought of it as a place where, you know, Sergeant Preston lived, and he always spoke English, so... Right. I think proud. But anyway, we get up there, and especially in Quebec, Montreal, Quebec, it's mostly French. So they all speak French. To go back up on my story, they started having me do interv interviews about my training and what I was doing. And I would go out and I'd, I'd try to, I was always very shy to speak in public or anything like that. Marty O'Neill, he was a smaller guy, short guy, and he would stick his arm up to get the mic in, in my face and most of, the, most of the guys that came through that door. And he'd ask me a, a good question about what I'd done that day to train and uh, and I'd say, well, Marty, I did, uh, I did this, uh, I ran so many push-ups, and I did uh, run, ran so many miles, and I did, you know, I just, uh, I could hardly speak, you know, and, and uh, Marty got frustrated with me after about three or four of those, and he says, burn, you got to teach that kid to talk. 
left I left Minneapolis and uh, went up to Canada, and it was the year of the uh, expo up there, Swan Salset, 1967. Everybody in Montreal was renting out rooms for fabulous amounts of money, and, and it, we wound up staying in a, we were outside side of Montreal, St. Hubert, St. Hubert is where we wound up, just outside of Montreal. We got a uh, one-room apartment that was like freezing cold in the winter so but we survived my wife's roommate before we left made a a german cape for me a short cape i had long black tights and i uh, i had shaved my head so i only had sidewalls then anyway so it didn't make any difference to me we took off and we got there and my first match was at the paul sauvé arena on tint Nief road in downtown minneapolis or <laughs> went to montreal okay <laughs> So uh, I get dressed in the places, they've got a good crowd there, you know, I'm due up, and I'm, I'm wrestling with a guy named Eddie O.J., a real a old pro that was really, really a good, good professional wrestler. So I go out there, and I have my match, and just march into the ring, because Dog walked with me, too, so they, they were mad at me anyway, they didn't like it, they didn't like Mad Dog, they didn't like me either, and I had kind of a sneer on my face, and was acting haughty, and whatever, but they didn't like me, and Eddie O.J. and I had, had a, a really good, entertaining match that the, the people really didn't like me for winning. So uh, I came back to the arena and they says, now go back out for an interview. Mad Dog and I went out for for an interview. And Mad Dog speaking in French and the French French announcer speaking in French, of course, asking him questions. And he's, <laughs> he turns to me and I had taken some Ger German in college. I wasn't fluent in it at all. So I knew a few words. And one of the words was restart which means to destroy. Well, I used right. that word about 80 times in about two minutes. I talked in a gruff voice, and I was excited and over-trying, but somehow that worked because uh, most of the crowd was French. They didn't understand me. I didn't understand them. But they didn't like the way I said whatever I said. That made it easier for me to eventually become a fairly decent interview guy. So working on from there, uh, Bad Dog and I were tag team partners. That's the reason he brought me up there to be his tag team partner, because he was fighting with the uh, Rougeau brothers and Edouard Carponce and Johnny Rougeau, Jacques Rougeau, and uh, all of those people. And we got together, and uh, it was like instant heat, because uh, he's not the tallest guy in the world, and I'm fairly tall about three inches taller than my hair i tell everybody just walk into the ring together there's some reason if there's a big guy and a little guy there's kind of automatic heat or if the guys two guys look almost alike that's probably heat too but anyway it got over it got over big because mad dog could carry the french and people didn't understand me but they knew they didn't like what i was saying so the first time we got together and it was against the rujos Probably the next uh, week at the Paul Sauvé, uh, the match ended and there was uh, a riot. <laughs> and wow. We had to fight our way out of the out, out of the ring and through the crowd. And Mad Dog was telling me what to do. Don't go down. They'll yeah. never get you up. So I, we, <laughs> we did what we had to do to get back uh, into the dressing room. And from that night on, the rest of the time we were there, every show ended up in a riot. And for some reason, the French Canadians really liked to fight a little better, be bold and brave in crowds. Later that year, uh, we were doing big business, and it was snowing. We'd uh, wrestle in Shikutsumi, and we were coming home. And it was one of those trips where they had uh, four midgets on the card, so they were working in every town. And for some reason, I was in a different town. There were two towns around, so they had me and Hans Schmidt in another town. Mad Dog's coming home, he's by himself, and he, he hits an icy spot in the park, which was snowy from, uh, probably it started in August through <laughs> May. He went off the road, flipped his car over, and he threw him out of the car. He landed on a rock, and he must have done the splits a little bit, because he split his pelvis. He was in the hospital. We heard about it. We were in a town called Ramuski that night, right across the river in Ramuski, and uh, Hans Schmidt and I, and we had a riot in that town. Everybody threw chairs in the ring. We escaped, and we came out after the police had cleared the building, and uh, everything was clear. <laughs> And we looked at the ring, and it looked like a mountain. The chairs were piled from the top of the mat clear up to the spotlights on top. So uh, we found out that Mad Dog had been in an accident, and we stopped at the 
hospital in Quebec City where they took him. We came in the door and Mad Dog was there laying in his bed, you know, and we're we're feeling really bad that he was hurt so bad. And we walk in and he looks at us and he starts to laugh. He says, <laughs> you guys look worse than I do. Because we had <laughs> things and bangs from being hit by the chairs and all that stuff. <laughs> anyway, that was my introduction to uh, being Baron Von Rasky. Oh, what a great story. Of course, you popularized the use of the claw hold. How did that come about? When was the first time you started using it? Was Did somebody tell you to start using it, or was it just something you sort of came up with organically? Somebody actually uh, told me to start using it. The way that happened, you know, Fritz von Erich had a claw. I think he called it the iron claw. I'm not sure. And other people had, had had claws in wrestling at different times, different places. Uh, when we left Montreal, we worked, worked uh, in the Michigan and Ohio territory. Then, then we went to Texas, and we worked, worked down there with Don Erickson. I saw his claw and felt his claw and all that stuff. It was just another hold that I didn't know much about it, so I didn't uh, try it or anything. But years later, I was flying into St. Louis from the Indianapolis territory, and I flew into St. Louis, and I was working with uh, Pat O'Connor one night. He was a world champion. Not at that time, but he had been world champion a couple of times before that. He was an excellent uh, ring technician and this, that, and the other. And we were out having a terrific match. A lot of story was told. And he got me down and was uh, spreading my legs apart. And I'm quite limber, so he was going way over here and way over there. And as he was doing it, he would lean, lean in towards me, towards my head. He says, put the claw on me, kid. Put the claw on me, kid. And he'd come back down again, put the claw on me, kid. And I said, what's the claw? Just put your hand on my head. So I, I reached up and I put my hand on his head. He grabbed my wrist and he started to wiggle and shake like he was being killed. And I, whoa, whoa, what's this? And around the ring we went and the people were going crazy. And da, 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 da. So I had that match and then I went back to... Indianapolis, and I was using something called a standing backbreaker at the time, and that was my what I finished the, the matches with. Anyway, Pat was coming through Indianapolis one time, and he and I worked in uh, Indianapolis at the fairgrounds, a big show. This was a few months later. He and Dick the Bruiser and Wilbur Snyder were were pretty tight. They were good friends, and Wilbur and Dick were running that territory. So uh, he said, "You got to get that kid to use the claw. That's all there is to it." So you know, I started using the claw. So it was, I, I, I got the claw by committee. I, I went to uh, Pat with the help of Dick the Bruiser and Wilbur Schneider, who were my bosses at the time. So that's that's that story. And then one final one. We had a fan ask us, Jace Nakarado, shout out to Jace up in Winnipeg. He wanted to know if you had any stories about going to Winnipeg with the AWA. Yeah, uh, Winnipeg was a great town. We always enjoyed going to Winnipeg, and uh, crowds were good. And Al Tromko, crazy legs. He got into promotion up there after a while, but yeah, he was good in the ring, and it really, uh, I liked Al quite a bit. Can't tell you how great this was to have you on, my friend. We go back a few years. We go back, uh, oh, I don't know, probably about 30 years. You and Bonnie have always been so gracious to me, and I just love you guys to death. You guys are some of my favorite people in the whole world. Thank you very much for being on, Baron. Thank you. Well, thank you for the kind words. You know, I, I couldn't live like the Baron all day, every day. But anyway, I had a great well, time uh, talking and uh, enjoying you and Hair James, and looks like you got a good, uh, good pod show going here, and I'll, I'll be one of the peas in the pod. So all I want to say is that is all you need to know. <laughs> Baron Von Rasky the Claw. A huge thank you to the Baron Baron Von Rashke for joining us. Wow, it was great getting to hear the full Baron Von Rashke creation story of sorts how he came to become the baron and we also want to give a thank you to the sod buster very capable kenny J, and mike wilson for joining us i think we did a really good job telling some of the untold stories of the awa over the past couple episodes any closing thoughts on the awa das ist richtig you know i don't think i've ever heard the story the evolution of james rashke into the baron so that was like really insightful. That was some historical stuff there. And then 
the origin of the claw hold, the infamous claw. That's some good stuff there, man. Without a doubt, there's nobody out there like the Baron anymore, and it's great that he's sharing those stories of the infamous claw. Everyone still, to this day, fears the claw from the Baron. But what do you think we should do next week, Carmine? You got any ideas? <laughs> Boy, do I have an idea for a podcast. Let's talk about the A to the Z, the greatest WWF champion of all time. Exactly, Baba. It's the story of the Iron Sheik. Carmine, you've got plenty of very interesting stories that involve the Iron Sheik from all over the globe, really. I had the opportunity and the pleasure of spending a lot of time with Sheiky Baby, and uh, we've always gotten along well, and we have a great rapport. And I just think it's it'll be fun to have some of the guys on, and we're just going to tell stories about the Sheik, the Iron Sheik, the one and the only, A to the Z. I think it's going to be a great time, and I hope you folks tune in for it. Indeed, it'll be a great time. But as we wrap things up, we want to get a few plugs out of the way. Be sure and like this video and subscribe to us on YouTube, contrary to popular wrestling. You can see all our videos there. We've got clips. You can go and listen to some of your favorite segments and moments from the show. You can also listen to us on all your favorite podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, you name it. You can find us there. You can even listen to us on your Amazon-enabled devices. Say, hey Alexa, play Contrary to Popular Wrestling on TuneIn. Be sure and subscribe to us on all those platforms. Give us a five-star review. It helps us out a bunch. Follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash contrarypod. And there you'll find out who we're going to have on to talk the A to the Z. We're going to tell some chic stories with some great guests. And that's where you'll find out who those guests are first. You can also send us an email at contrarypod, C-O-N-T-R-A-R-Y-P-O-D at gmail.com. Send us a question, a comment, a concern. We will read it and we'll get back to you. Or we might read your question on the air or a correction. We had to do a few of those. So send us an email there. Well, Carmine, until next week, we will see everyone. And next time we speak to them, we will be talking about the, the chic from the A to the Z. And just once more... That is all the people need to know.